Hey, good morning, everyone. Well, my relationship with data began 18 years ago when um, I was first a PhD student. And it's been a relationship which has been both exciting and frustrating in exact equal measures, but ultimately very rewarding. So when I first started working with data um, for the first, say, six or eight years of my research life, um, I used secondary data. So I used data that other people collected. Okay, it was only more recently, in the last 10 years, I've actually started collecting my own data. So initially, when I was a, a PhD student, I was doing a really bizarre PhD. Um, I was going into the Czech archives in Prague and getting statistical yearbooks um, to look at regional unemployment rates and voting behavior and all this kind of very like, going into the archives, collecting my own data. Uh, well, not collecting my own data, collecting data other people had collected. Um, subsequently, there was a flood in Prague. You probably heard about it. Those archives were completely um, flooded, and most of that data was then lost. So I think, actually, I'm one of the few people that actually has access to this, these historical um, yearbooks from the Czech Republic, which is interesting. I should probably give them to someone, but anyway. Um, and then once I, I started doing my postdoc here in UCD, I started using a very different type of data quantitative data as well, birth cohort data. So the UK Data Archive have these wonderful data sets where they've been collecting data on people's lives throughout their, throughout their lives. Mainly I focused on the National Child Development Study, which was um, where they took all children who were born one week in March 1958, and they've been following those children throughout their lives. So they had 18,000 children when they started, and they went back to interview those children when they were 7, 16, 23, 33, 42, 52, and now I believe it's their 60th birthday, so they're probably collecting data too. And I had a wonderful few years. Looking back, I, you know, at the time, I thought it was very difficult to do this type of work. But looking back, I realized I was in a nirvana. It was so easy. You just download this data set. You literally went onto the UK Data Archive. You press download. You got this 18,000 people in a data set. And then you could download all the, diff the different waves. And me and my co-author would sit in our office and write these lovely papers looking at you know, the impact of early childhood experiences on later life outcomes. So what are the long-term benefits of breastfeeding? What are the long-term benefits of being in, in, in say, high-quality childcare? Um, is voting behavior a habit? What influences voting behavior? Do our parents influence our voting behavior? So we had a really successful couple of years together where we wrote these good papers and we got into good journals and everything was going really well. Then something happened and suddenly I found myself um, somehow designing and running um, one of the first social experiments that was ever conducted in Ireland. And that um, experiment was called Preparing for Life. So we started evaluating an early childhood intervention program called Preparing for Life, which is operating or started operating here in Dublin. And as far as I know, there was, there's not that many randomized control trials of social policies in Ireland. Um, so I think this was one of the first. So we recruited 233 pregnant women and we randomly assigned them to a treatment group and a control group. The treatment group received really intensive parenting supports for five years. So they had a mentor who went to their homes once every two weeks to kind of educate parents about parenting and child development. They took place in parenting classes, baby massage classes, and so on. And it was our job as researchers to figure out if this program worked. The aim of the program was to try to improve child skills, to improve their cognitive skills, improve their health, improve their socio-emotional well-being. And we were working in one of the most disadvantaged communities in Dublin. So this was really trying to reduce social inequalities and children's skills. There was an implementation team who ran the intervention. It was our job as researchers to evaluate, does this program work? And we did that by collecting our own data. And this is where I started collecting my own data, having never collected my own data before. Um, this brought a whole set of new learning and new challenges. Um, first, I'm an economist. I should never be let near real people, so I couldn't go out and collect the data myself. I had to hire a lovely team of psychologists who were, had the skills to go and talk to people, not economists who don't. Um, so I had to hire a team of people. We had to learn how to, how do you create a survey? What do you ask people? How do you design a survey so that people will be able to answer the questions and you get meaningful answers? Um, we also had to, you know, I was this project lasted 10 years. So we were following these children over a 10 year period. We still are following them. Um, so we needed to keep them engaged. We needed to keep the, some way of making sure the parents would come back to us every year and answer our questions. And we collected lots of different types of data. Um, we collected survey data. So we went into the homes once every six months and we interviewed the parents for about an hour and a half. Um, the amount of data we got from that, so we have eight rounds of that type of data, mainly maternal reported data on the child's ability and parenting skills and things like that. 
So in any one of those data sets, we ha probably have one to 2,000 observations, one to 2,000 variables. You know, so it's a huge amount. We collected so much data on these families' lives. So we have eight rounds of interview data. We also collected data from the maternity hospital records, from the children's hospital, their records as well. Um, we collected data from the schools, from their teachers. Um, so that's all quantitative data. We have diary data that the parents completed. We collected, um, we used wrist-mounted biosensors to collect electrodermal activity. Um, and qualitative data as well. So qualitative data, typically economists don't use this type of data. So for me, it was a very new world to use qualitative data. But we did. We, did, we conducted a number of focus groups with the mothers, so two rounds of focus groups with the mothers. We conducted one round of focus groups with the fathers and father figures. So initially when we went in, we were like, we want, to, we want to interview the fathers, do focus groups with the fathers. And we realized that there weren't enough fathers living with these children who, who uh, could be interviewed. So it was really interesting. So what do you do? Well, we actually found that many of the children were living in houses that, um, you know, they, they, maybe they weren't with their biological father, but they had father figures. They lived with a grandparent. They lived with an uncle. They had an older brother. So that was really interesting. We expanded it out to capture all father figures in these children's lives. That was something quite new. We also interviewed all the uh, service providers, the mentors who went into the homes every two weeks to deliver the treatment, to deliver the intervention. We interviewed all stakeholders, the funders, government officials who work in this area. We did documentary analysis where we got all the minutes of meetings um, surrounding the program as well. And what other type of data do we collect? And we, you can see we collected an awful lot of data. Um, we also went and conducted direct assessments um, with the children um, because, you know, when they were really little, we couldn't really do much. With, they, they weren't very responsive when you asked children questions. They're babies, can't speak yet. But as soon as they got older, we started actually interacting with the children themselves. And we actually um, started measuring, say, their cognitive ability, their executive functioning skills and things like that once they were in school, uh, in preschool. Um, we also, it's very interesting getting data from children. Um, you know, we use puppets. So we had like this puppet called Riley the Rabbit, and Riley the Rabbit um, had to go to school, and we had to ask like, what, what the children, what do you think Riley the Rabbit would feel when he's in school? What, how, what would he do in this situation? So it was an interesting way of trying to get data from children, from four-year-old children who typically don't, you know, it can be hard for four-year-old children to speak to strangers, right? So we needed to get data in a particular way, and we used puppets, we used pictures, we asked them to draw a picture, and then we asked them to tell us what that picture was about. So we actually have all these, so we didn't archive those. We have all the pictures from all the children, which they drew as well. And we also have the narrative of them explaining um, why they drew what was in the picture. And they were really revealing. Um, you know, we asked them to draw about school, a picture about them in school. And so many of those pictures had their parents or their sisters or their family in the, in the school picture, which seemed a bit strange. But there you go. That's because obviously there was this big connection between family and school. Thanks. Um, so some of the other challenges, I mean, it was 10 years of collecting this data, there was lots of challenges. Um, one of the biggest ones was, it wasn't a challenge, but we had to deal with um, data protection. We were collecting such a huge amount of data on a relatively small population of 233 people who all lived in one community in Dublin, right? We, have, we know everything about these, these families' lives. So we had to, we working with, with the IT manager in Geary, you know, we set up our own server, all our laptops, all our desktops, all our USB keys, everything was encrypted. Um, we, we developed our own data protection protocol that we used. We had UCDs one, but at the time it wasn't actually that good because we started this 10 years ago. So we developed our own. Now I think UCD has caught up, but we, um, we, were, we were very conscious that this data was incredibly sensitive. Um, and we had an awful lot of it as well. So we are very, very conscious about keeping that data secure. So we had to, I, we had to, I never knew about this stuff. I had to learn about this stuff. Um, other things was, it's incredibly expensive to collect your own data. I'm not sure if anyone you do, but um, so our budget, the budget for the actual running the intervention in the program was 5 million euros, but the budget for our evaluation to figure out this program worked was 1 million euros. So it was a very expensive, but we have so much data. <laughs> Incredibly expensive to collect this type of data on such a regular basis from this cohort. Um, the project finished uh, last year when the intervention finished, and that's when the children were five years old. However, I ha now have funding to go on and follow those children when they're nine years old and 13 years old. Um, but when we finished, um, so we always wanted to, we always intended to make this data publicly available. It was 50% funded through government and 50% funded through philanthropy. 
And it's my belief that any publicly funded data should be made available to other researchers. So right from the get-go, when the parents consented to join the programme, we also asked them to consent whether or not their data could be placed in the Irish Social Science Data Archive. And this was 10 years ago, so we were very <laughs> thinking quite forwardly and forwardly thinking, eventually we will archive this data, do we have consent? And every single parent we asked said, yes, you can consent, our, uh, we, you can archive our, our data. Um, obviously, the identified <coughs> data. So once the project finished, I kind of was like, oh, yeah, we have to archive this. Damn. <laughs> um, you know, we were always going to do it, and we always talked and said we're going to do it, but then we actually had to do it. So my first was fear, basically, okay? For many, many reasons, but my first, my first thing was fear. Um, you know, if you spend 10 years of your life investing in collecting this data, you know, um, you designed it, we designed it, I collected it, or we collected it, um, and then suddenly you'd have to hand it over to someone else, and anyone else can use it. And yeah, that's difficult, it's difficult. Um, but for me, I mean, I spent the first six years of my research life using data that other people collected. So of course then, I said, okay, no, you have to do it. The other reason I felt fearful was because what if someone takes our data and, you know, basically tries to show that what we did was wrong? That, you know, we've published many papers looking at the impact of this program. What if someone else gets our data and tries to reproduce our results and can't? Or tries to, you know, find, basically claim what we were doing was wrong in some way. Um, so that's the other idea, but I guess that's good. If we did make a mistake, or if we analyze the data somehow incorrectly, then that's just producing better science, better scientific evidence. So that's, you know, hopefully we did everything correct. Um, the other thing was, you know, what if someone kind of take, well, there's so many other papers and studies that we want to use with this data, and what if now by making it publicly available to everyone else, they're going to steal all our ideas and do all the things now that I want to do. But I, again, that can happen. But um, I suppose to counteract that, I kind of had to think, look, if I can't write a good paper with this data, no one else will be able to, because I know it so well. So for various reasons, I went through this whole debate. I had to archive it, but it was difficult. Then came the practicalities of actually trying to get the data ready for archive, and I cannot under over I cannot cannot state um, enough how much time and effort it takes to prepare data for archiving. I was looking again, as you said, there's no money to archive this data. We had 10 years worth of data, thousands, thousands of observation, qualitative data, quantitative data, hospital data, you name it, we had it. Um, so it was a big task. I was lucky enough to get a grant, though. The Children's Research Network of Ireland and Northern Ireland were making archiving grants available to archive data. I was involved in setting up that initiative because I used to be the chair of the Children's Research Committee. So, because I really believe that we should archive data. So we set up a fund, I got funding, we set up this funding scheme that allowed researchers to apply for grants to archive data that was generated under this prevention early intervention initiative. So I'm no longer the chair, and I wasn't the chair last year, but I applied for a grant and I got small grants to be able to archive this data, which meant I could hire a research assistant to work on preparing the data. But it was very, you know, it was hard. It, there, there, we, we, I mean, I think I was in, in contact with, with lots of people here in the archive about what are the rules around the de identification? What can you include? What can't you include? You know, we, when we looked at um, for best practice in lots of other places as well, and there's no real set of there's no real set of debt criteria that you should use. For example, in one, I found one article that said you shouldn't provide imputed data. I found another article that said you should provide imputed data. You know, so there was kind of like, what do you do? Do you impute? Don't you impute? Um, do you provide weights? Don't you provide weights? There's no real rules. Also, because we have a really small sample size, it wasn't just a matter of taking out everyone's names and address, which obviously we didn't have people's names and addresses in there anyway. But, you know, we had to make sure, okay, if someone accesses these four variables and does a cross tab, can they actually identify someone, right? So we had to go through thousands of variables and make sure there was no way in which anyone could be identified by combining any combination of variables um, in the data set. So it was very time consuming and very difficult. But now the data is archived, um, so that's all great. As of the summer, it has been in, the quantitative data has been archived. The qualitative data is still being prepared for archive at, in, in the Irish Qualitative Data Archive. It's not here in UCD, it's in Minute. Um, but so the qualitative data is still being prepared, but all our quantitative data is now available. If anyone wants to use it, go ahead and use it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, and a, a number, um, so Jenny told me that a number of people have actually already downloaded the data and are using it. And you're kind of like, what are they doing with it? You get really curious. 
Um, but that, that all, has also come with, with, come with um, questions. So just in the last week, we've been dealing with questions that people have who've accessed the data, and they have lots of different questions. I mean, we have, we've provided code books for everything that we did. We also have a big manual as well that we had to provide describing everything that we did as well. But of course, people are always going to have questions once they get the data. Um, and one of the researchers found a mistake in coding. And that was made. It wasn't our mistake, thankfully. It was a third party's mistake. But it was a mistake, and it was a pretty big mistake. But someone else noticed it, thankfully. So now we've re recoded the data, and everything is fine again. Um, another researcher contacted me th through the archives saying, oh, you know, why isn't this variable available? And that variable was uh, gestational age, which we got from the maternity hospital records. And we didn't have consent to archive the maternity hospital records because it was hospital data. You know, they owned it. So. You know, but I can give her the data. So now I think we're going to collaborate on a project together um, in terms of looking at the impact of gestational age on children's math scores. So, you know, there's a lot of positive things from data sharing. Um, there's a lot of frustrations as well. But um, overall, it's been a really, really good experience. But I just feel now having archived this data, and again, I'd love to keep archiving our nine-year-old, 13-year-old, our 20-year-old data once we collect it. Um, but I'm going to be dealing with this for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'm going to be having people emailing me about, about this, this data, which is, which is great. I'm happy to do it. Thank you.